So I think Baroque music really there's a there's a kind of physical aspect to it, it's wonderful. Which, which, which is which is which is at the same time very earthy, but also quite profound. I think because it links it links with your your body in a way. Madag, Erik. How are you doing? I'm fine and you? Oh, very well, thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. Um, tell me, where are you based? Where are you now at the moment? So I'm in, I'm in Cape Town. I live in, in Cape Town, close to the city centre. Um, and I've been um, uh, living here for about eight years now. I, I moved back here um, eight years ago. I studied and then worked for quite a few years in London and yeah. then eight years ago I made the, <laughs> the step to the uh, uh, move back here. Yeah. Partly, partly to, um, because I was at that point in thinking about uh, enrolling for a PhD and I wanted to do it about a, a local topic, something South African and um, so, so I came here for a few months to kind of see what uh, 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 source materials there are and, and the possibilities, and and then um, yeah, and so partly because of that, I got I got stuck here uh, very happily, and, oh, okay. uh, and, and I've just I've just completed that last year. <laughs> so oh wow! That's, Congratulations! That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> but you are. Um... A boy from a very small town in South Africa. I am indeed. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> now, how how does the boy from Muriesberg end up playing the harpsichord? Because that's not an instrument that's uh, lying around yes. in Muriesberg. Well, it's it's there are there are three parts to the story. The, okay. the one is I I remember coming home. You know, like. Like uh, uh, many kids, I, I started with piano lessons. And I, when it was about nine or 10, I remember coming home one day um, with this little Baroque piece, you know, that was in the grade one or two syllabus and being very excited about that. So uh, it's a strange thing because this, this style of music in a way just, I suppose, spoke to me automatically. Um, so, so that's the, the 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 one thing. The other thing is that I was from from very little. Of course, we went to church, and I was always fascinated by the organ. You know, this kind of mysterious machine up 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 on the organ loft. Um, so, and 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 I I started organ lessons at at uh, thirteen years of age, very happily at the the conservatoire in Stellenbosch, where my parents drove me through once a week. Wow. Um, and and of course, playing the organ, you you kind of encounter baroque music a lot. You know, that's kind of kind of the starting point. So so that's that's the second part, and the third part is that when I um, I still took piano lessons in Muries, but I went to, I finished my schooling there and, and my music teacher at the time passed away and her husband asked me to, to clear out a room and uh, kind of sort the books and CDs and so. And I, I came across this one disc that was a compilation disc of, of uh, music by Bach um, recorded by John Elliot Gardner, the English Baroque soloist and so. And I just couldn't stop listening to this. <laughs> I think I listened to wow. the thing twice in a day. So then, you know, that the kind of the whole world of um, historical performance and 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 um, uh, original instruments opened up to me at seventeen. And 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 I I specifically remember that as a as a as a as a moment where I I thought I I can't believe that that Baroque oboes can sound like this. It was really the most wonderful thing that I've heard. Or that singers can sing like this or, or string instruments. Um, it, it, it was quite a quite a special moment. Um, yeah, and so so then my path led me to, to Stellenbosch. I did an undergrad there, um, uh, specializing in, in organ performance, um, but also doing harpsichord on the side of it. And then I got a scholarship at the, at the Royal College of Music. Um, to go study organ performance, but of course I went there, <laughs> and and um, then for the first time I, I was at an institution where there was a, a proper early music 
department and and it wasn't two weeks um, until I went and I saw the head of uh, um, postgrad studies and I said look is there any chance that I can switch over to harpsichord and and um, and early music and you know the, the amazing thing is that they let me do that um, of course with the provision that they still continued uh, you know to be part of the organ department but they let me do that and they they also let me keep my scholarship which is which is very very special actually yeah. and um yeah and then uh, a, a whole lot of years later i had a few uh, kind of lessons master classes with with trevor pinnock and um uh, who founded the, 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 the English concert. And he then told me that he also was a student at the Royal College and uh, an organ student, and he wanted to do a harpsichord. And apparently the director at the time told him he can't because the harpsichord is not a real instrument. <laughs> so My goodness. Uh, so I often <laughs> say some things do actually change for the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know, maybe it was just that moment, that right moment that you went to ask. It we never know I, these things, you know. I suppose, and it's you know, it's I kind of I often think about you know your path and and and, yeah. and certain things lead you to to other things, and and um, often you can explain it, and, and sometimes not. But but I very very often think about how lucky one is to to have something that really interests you and and that kind of sometimes i i think you know it's on the verge, verge of obsession a little bit but it, it it's a really wonderful thing because this 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 automatic kind of direction and, and drive in your life and something that that kind of gives it sense in a way so so i'm, I'm yeah. tremendously i think fortunate that there was something like that for me well, for me, it's always this interesting thing how musicians get to their instruments, you know, and, and these paths. And it's sometimes a very small thing that, you know, they heard something here or they, it, yeah. it's, and, and, and I was just very fascinated uh, because that you came from, you, you don't come from uh, London, <laughs> you know, where, where you would think, okay, well, you, there's a big possibility that you might have heard um the harpsichord yes but now yes. um i also saw on facebook that you you work on the harpsichord you uh, are you um uh, restoring a harpsichord so, so i yeah i do of course it's one of the things i'm very attracted to uh or was very attracted to as i said as a child this mysterious machine on the organ loft the organ I, I, I was always fascinated by keyboard instruments and, and how they work because it's a it's a really wonderful thing. I mean, if you think, especially in terms of organs, how complex they are and and um, in building them, how many decisions need to be made and you know at the end to have some some kind of aesthetic meaning. But generally, in the early music movements, uh, right from the start of it, the mid twenty in the mid twentieth century. I think many practitioners also then embraced uh, something of the craftsmanship of 17th century and 18th century musicians in the sense that coming closer to your instrument, you also learn to make instruments or repair instruments So, and, and, and have to do with maintenance. So um, you find many, very many uh, very well-known early musicians in fact, making instruments too. And also I have a bit of a fascination with how keyboard instruments work. Um, I'm very lucky that here in Cape Town, we have uh, Bill Robson, who has for many, many years uh, been building harpsichords and, and, and Baroque style organs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's had quite a practice and his instruments are all over the world. So there is somebody, um, yeah, that you know, you, one can go see and can advise and so on. And I've recently taken a decision to, to, to because I've always maintained my own instruments and, and, and for personal use and so. But I've I've recently taken the decision to, in a way, connect with Bill um, a little bit more. Um, also, as I think he's moving closer to a retirement age, um, so that I can kind of take. Take, learn and then take over some of those skills as, as much as I can. 
So I have recently been taking on some some minor repair jobs for other people, and it's and it's quite a, a, an interesting process, uh, um, kind of learning new skills and and um, kind of finding a, 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 a system of problem solving, you know, if this is wrong, it can be this or this or that, and how do you test what, you know, what are the actions to be taken. Um, and of course, these days, with with the internet and, and um, you know, YouTube tutorials, there are wonderful resources uh, of instrument builders that, that you can, and platforms on Facebook and so on, that you can easily post questions and, and get advice from really, uh, very uh, uh, skilled people, so 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 it's quite quite an interesting process. That yeah. Well, um, apart from the the instrument itself, it's visually also a beautiful instrument, and and you've got a lot of decoration on it. And I spoke to a, a, a luthier um, a while ago uh, making guitars, and he's he, this is something that he mentioned that ancient or older instruments had these decorative um, uh, features, you know, and, and it's not seen today anymore. I mean, pianos are rarely made that way. So how much of the original um, artwork is still on your harpsichord? That, that's a very, very interesting point because the visual, the visual aspect is important. And I think, um, I think, uh, some of my the instruments that I own are are, are 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 very beautiful in the sense that they are decorated or made in in quite a, a specific way. I, I think when one thinks of the Baroque, of course, you know, an Italian style instrument looks completely different than a French style instrument or an English instrument, and so so I think um, a kind of guiding principle for me is that if 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 you go for an original style of decoration or, or a visual aesthetic, then, then it has to be quite properly done. Oh, I yeah, think it can, yeah. can quite easily look quite yeah. <laughs> off or, or tacky. Um, no, yeah, it's, it's interesting because also sometimes, you know, if you have an instrument that you take around a lot, um, you, you, you know, you don't necessarily you'd rather have a plainly painted instrument uh, you know that you put in your car and you take on tour than something an instrument with gold leaf on it oh, yeah. and, and so. but but yeah i i sometimes wonder i mean i I've, i have this uh, uh, one instrument which is a, a italian style instrument so it, it's a it's a very beautifully made uh, uh, instrument and and the italian style instruments were often made with an inner and an outer so mm -hmm. so the real instrument is quite um uh, 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 quite thinly made, so that is quite resonant, and that is in an outer case with the lid. So, of course, oh, the outer okay. case you can you can take the inner out, the real instrument, uh, which is just wooden, and you can kind of redecorate the the outer case as as you like, and in, in, in historically, of course, in the newest fashion. Um, but but this outer case, um, it's it's painted a, a very plain red. Um, as often would have been done, but in the inside of the lid, it's still empty. And really, what is needed there uh, is is a painting. And um, and I, I it's, it's quite difficult to get somebody to do a, a proper baroque style painting. Of course, it has to be an Italian style baroque painting, a landscape, and so on. And and I've I've recently been toying with the idea to perhaps. Um, Get a contemporary artist to 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 put an yeah. artwork inside of the lid. And I I I think I remember years ago I came across an instrument I think in Canada which 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 is like that. And I thought kind of it, it definitely had had some evoked some reaction within me. Mm -hmm. But recently I've I've been thinking uh, it's quite interesting that juxtaposition. Yeah. But but the spirit of it is still in a way, in the original spirit, that this instrument is not only a musical object, but also an aesthetic object. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, I think I'll definitely, I'll have to keep you up to date on that yeah, one. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> no, that really caught my eye. And, and I, and, and, and when this, uh, when he said this, I realized, yes, it's true, you know, that, um, 
it's sort of you you just get a black piano for example but yeah but now also the idea we, that, yeah? that i think uh, uh, the idea of um with pianos in a way you know you get to a concert hall and there's a black yeah. concert grand on it's it's in a way of course they're not all the same and they don't exactly look the same but to a great extent it's almost standardized but with harpsichords it's it's really so diverse and, and i'm also attracted to that idea that that um that everywhere you go there's a different sound and a different look to it mm. yeah. but now uh talking about contemporary is it uh, with a harpsichord is it possible to um experiment with music because this is something that i see a lot also um i actually saw just last night um a cellist playing the cello as a guitar and and you get also uh, string instruments where they really experiment with sound and also you know tapping on the body of the instrument making sound with the body so is that something that you do with a harpsichord that's that's interesting i used to study one of my teachers at the uh, at the rcm was um, jane chapman who, who and a great part of her practice was uh, contemporary harpsichord music and and um if i say contemporary i really mean contemporary not yeah. not kind of mid 20th century music so uh very much kind of explorative uh, exploring the sonorities of the instrument in many ways not only playing it on the keyboard side um uh, and and in the netherlands there's, there's quite a well known competition the the uh, pre Anneli de Man, uh, which specializes in contemporary harpsichord uh, uh, repertoire. So there is a whole, there's a whole world of contemporary harpsichord repertoire out there. I have, I have dabbled in it a bit, but but not in not in recent years so much. I, I, I in a way, I think I've um, kind of delve, delving deeper in specific types of repertoire and in in in, in early music. I. I sometimes wish you had four lifetimes oh, to yeah. spend, you know, just simply not enough time to <laughs> to play all the repertoire that you want and and I I do have a bit of a, a, a personality that tends to kind of want to go deeper into something rather than branch out generally so, so I get you um, there I get you <laughs> totally there <laughs> but um but do you only then now you say um you know you you play older music and but is it can you arrange something specifically for the harpsichord and does it sound then even if it's if it's later music i'm not talking contemporary but if it's later music can you can you arrange it for the harpsichord yes absolutely i think i think we are um we we tend to be I, I find now it's better I, I i but i think there was a stage in western music where uh, the establishment was quite you know by snobbish about arranging of repertoire for different instruments and and i did a whole i did a solo organ and harpsichord recital uh, i have a solo organ and harpsichord recital program which is exclusively um trans uh, uh, transcriptions of orchestral repertoire and I, and i think we often forget of course that you know if you went to an opera in 1720 or or or, or, or something similar um you couldn't if you like the music you couldn't go out and, and buy a cd oh, yeah. um but what you could do is you could go to a publisher who uh, arranged made arrangements of that music or arias uh, for often keyboard uh, uh, instruments so that you could buy a book and go go play those tunes to yourself at home so there's there's um thousands and thousands of publications historical publications that are transcriptions of symphonies and opera arias and overtures and and either in chamber arrangements or in in, in solo keyboard arrangements okay. um and and even very well known composers did the same i mean bach famously transcribed uh, the the Marcello Oboe concerto some concerti by Vivaldi for solo harpsichord for solo organ and um, so I, i'm quite attracted to the the idea of transcription and um of course transcription in its realist sense 
you bring something new to that that repertoire uh, because you bring the sonorities of the new instrument to the repertoire. And I think that to me that's quite a fascinating, a fascinating um, um, topic. Um, we know that, for instance, somebody like um, uh, the, the early 19th century virtuoso pianist uh, Morsellius um, uh, played, um, I think, Chopin waltzes and so on on harpsichords. <laughs> and so, so I think that it kind of carried on for, for a little bit later than, than we often think it did. So, um, so yes, no, I'm, I'm quite a fan of, of, of uh, transcription and, and, and also I must say, I think something that, 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 that we come up here a lot is that um, over the past year, few years with the Cape Town Baroque Orchestra, you know, we now have a, a very dedicated group of, of period string instrument players, period continue, a few woodwinds and so, but we don't always have exactly the right instruments for certain pieces. And um, the idea of seeing an orchestral scoring also as an arrangement of sorts. Um, I'm thinking about, for instance, uh, 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 Handel, who composed uh, Messiah in 1741, um, but the next year, um, the first performance in Dublin, uh, there wasn't uh, really, I, as far as I understand, there wasn't oboes, uh, oboe players there. That's good enough. So um, the first performances of Messiah were uh, just for strings and trumpets. Oh. So, so again, uh, kind of uh, using the players and instruments that you have in a certain setting and adjusting the music to that. And that, that's a very typical thing of the Baroque. I mean, and even later, Mozart traveling with one of his operas and, and rewriting arias according to which singers he had available. Um, and again, Messiah is, a, is an example of that, that in essence, Handel rewrote some arias and some different versions of arias for every single performance according to the singers that were available. So, so um, yeah, I think that that links with your very interesting uh, transcription idea is that especially earlier repertoire is, ne is not so much set in stone for a certain scoring or instrumentation. And, 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 and I think that's something that attracts, attracts me to it. It's, it's a bit more flexible and, and leaves space for your own interpretation and space for yeah. the interpretation of what you have available around, around you. Yeah, and of course, the more, like you say, in depth you go in the instrument, you you um, discover these things that uh, that was done those days. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and very often these things are quite. It's quite surprising. I mean, I um, I uh, two years ago during the lockdown, we did a production of um, the Pergolesi Stubbard Martyr with with Kate on opera and and some dancers from the Caton City Ballet. And, um, and so I did a little bit of research uh, about the piece and, 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 and of course Bach made a transcription of, of the Stubbard Mater, um, but, but as a psalm setting. And um, then I realized that he transposed the piece into E minor, from F minor to E minor. But then I went and I saw the, the, the manuscript parts and, um, clearly they had, as we know, this situation was with Bach, they had uh, woodwind instruments and strings and keyboard instruments at different pitches. Um, and that's literally an example where he found a practical solution where the, the, the string players would play in one key, um, the, the, the keyboard in another key, and the, the woodwinds in another key, for instance, something like that. Uh, where you where you realize that even somebody like Bach with very very specific ideas um, had to come up with practical solutions sometimes. And wonderful that you still have the transcripts of that, you know, of that course. you can actually <laughs> see it. <laughs> it's kind of seeing somebody like that who is an absolute uh, a wonder <laughs> yeah. come up come up with a really pragmatic solution to a problem. I'm, I'm so glad those days we didn't have the cloud 
uh, where you yeah. could have saved it. So it's actually in on transcript, and you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, Eric, now tell me, in in Cape Town, do you have a, a big following um, in, in for Baroque music and and the harpsichord music? Yeah, I, I Petra, we've been so when I moved back here, I the the what was then called uh, Camerata Tenta Baroca, yeah. um, Quentin Creda. Uh, was a violinist with the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, founded this group in, I think, 2005 or six, it might be. So it, it was really a group of players from the Philharmonic Orchestra that, um, that kind of wanted to do regular Baroque concerts. Mm -hmm. I believe it was after the Philharmonic Orchestra did a, did a performance, uh, a complete performance of all the Brandenburg concerti. So after that, so he then created this group, Camerata Tenta Barocca, and and um, and when I moved back, I, I started working with them. Um, and then about five years ago, Quentin uh, moved to Scotland, um, and the, uh, the trustees asked me if I'd be willing to 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 uh, step on, uh, come aboard as artistic director of the group. And I then made the quite tough decision to say, in terms of branding and also in terms of a, a kind of focus, a focus is really necessary that we move over completely to period instruments. Um, so the few years before I stepped, stepped on as artistic director, Quentin already kind of explored period instruments, but it was a situation of half and half or some projects on modern instruments and some on period instruments. So, um, so, but but when I came on board, I, I really started the process of um, uh, building up a, a core group of players and, and collecting instruments, of course, and so on. And many of the players by now has bought their own instruments. And, um, and I think that in a way, of course, the, the, especially five years ago, there was a little bit of a novelty aspect to it. Um, but I think also the audiences really, um, you hear the difference, you hear the difference. I often say, uh, you know, using, I use the, the, the kind of expression, uh, using the right tools or not the right, perhaps appropriate uh, tools for the job. You know, you can, you can, um, uh, you can kind of great, try to grate cheese with a knife, but if you have a cheese grater, it's just much easier and, and it's more yeah. apparent. And I think, I think it's the same, same type of thing. So certain things about the music becomes apparent and you learn something of the music through the instruments. And, um, yeah, so that's, I think we've now, we've got a very de dedicated audience space and, um, about four, five years ago, four years ago, we started the Cape Town Baroque Festival, which is a Baroque festival once a year. Um, uh, in September, October this year, it will be the first one since since the lockdown, since 2019. So, um, and and there's also, we were really amazed by the number of people that showed up and and, um, and uh, uh, is very appreciative. I, I, I often say, I mean, the, 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 the thing is just getting, getting somebody into the concert. I think yeah. people often think, oh, it's, it's very heavy and, and difficult to understand. But, but I, I've almost, without fail, never seen anybody that, you know, that, that it was their first concert that, that came and, and thought, oh my gosh, this is really, it's not that strange and, and, yeah. and difficult. And I think as a performer, of course, the challenge is that, you know, we, all the early sources say that, that your goal as a musician is to move your audience, yeah. to move them emotionally to, um, and, and that is really the motto. You know, I, I, I feel they, there's not, for me personally, of course, I can't project this onto everybody, but for me personally, the, the reason why I make music is to, to share it with people and to, and to move them, to make them feel something that perhaps the music makes me feel. And, um, and 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 baroque music is 
was written with that in mind. It was designed to do that. So it's it's very expressive music, and 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 I think if you play it successfully, you you bring across that expression and and, and the richness of expression within it. So so. Um, I think that's also what I want to do with the Cape Town Rock Orchestra is my, my goal that, that we don't we don't just play music because you know it's something to do, that we really yeah. think about what what is it you want to say with the music. And 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 I think that's also val valuable for musicians, you know, to, to in a way find your own musical voice about what you what you want to say, what you want to bring across to your audience. Um, well, yeah. yeah, it's interesting that you say that because during lockdown, I also spoke to many musicians and we spoke about this um, this topic that, uh, you know, art being valued and, and um, you know, what, what the role of the artist is in, in our society. And I feel uh, also that, yes, uh, you know, it's the, the artists want to move the audience and, and give this, this gift to the audience. But also in a way, I felt um, maybe it's a way of educating as well, you know, that it's, it's, it's the way of uh, exposing the, the public. People like, for instance, I'm not a musician, but the moment I hear something new or I hear something and somebody can just give me a little bit of a background, then it makes my whole experience of this listening uh, so much different, you know? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. And I also, I, I, we always in the concerts, very short, you know, rather yeah. than have a very formal situation of somebody walking on stage and playing for an hour and walking off um i i speak to the audience in between and you know it's not in a patronizing way but just a few pointers or a little background that brings the, the music in a way home more and, and makes it understandable but but something you said Petra, it resonates with me um which i think is is i find it quite important <laughs> is that I think one must never underestimate your audiences because I very often come up to, to a thing where say festivals or so will say, but remember the programming must be popular. It must be popular things that, that audiences would recognize. And of course, you, one tends to put those things in programs here and there, but, but I think audiences instinctively react to good music, you know, yeah. whether it's music that they know or not. And especially if, 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 you, if you help them a little bit in a direction with some background. Um, uh, so, so I think one must not be scared to, to challenge your audiences with, with repertoire that's not known or with repertoire that's perhaps a little bit more on the um, uh, metaphysical or heavy side. I, yeah. I, I really, I think one, one must not be scared um, be scared of that. Um, the other thing that that's 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 that I also that you, you said about the the lockdown and we've we've produced quite a, a bit of video material and recordings and so on. Um, and of course, it's it's during these this past two years that you that I've come to realize you know a camera <laughs> a camera is a is a black hole. Yeah. <laughs> it just. It just takes, <laughs> um, and of course, it's it's a wonderful way of documenting what, what you do and what you've done. But but um, the idea that that I don't think audiences realize to what an extent they contribute to a performance by what they give back to you in a way, the energy that you get you get back from an audience, um, and 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 then then you realize. I mean, really, what one has been doing all your life, and, and you've been trained in a certain craft, you know, that 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 is dependent on the audience, and yeah. the audience is very, very important in what we do. Yeah, and exactly that was uh, what what these artists used to say to me, you know, and this is what I also, I mean, we were talking while it was locked down, and and they were expressing how you know, getting on stage and feeling the audience and sensing the audience, you know, and like one pianist uh, told me that he can immediately um, 
when he steps on stage, he can already sense the audience and that in a way also, um, uh, you know, influences his playing. Uh, you know that it that it it's uh, he can feel when it's when the feeling is right there, and I never realized it. You know, I I never realized it that it is felt from the stage as well. So it's exactly Absolutely. what you're saying, yeah. And also, I think a good a good musician, in a way, responds to the feeling in a room. Yeah. Uh, so it's not about just going sitting there and, and playing exactly like how you rehearsed. The atmosphere in the room is perhaps a little bit more lethargic, a little bit more energetic, and 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 you take that in account and work with it and and yeah. work with the expectation of the audience. And that's it's really a very special thing. And and I must say it it really took a, a pandemic to really bring home to you how important that is. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I tell uh, all across the board, even the ballet dancers, you know, used to say to me, it's, you can rehearse in a studio every single day, but it's that moment you get on the stage, there's something else, that energy that pushes you just that much further than you would have done in a, in a, you know, in a studio. Okay. And yeah, it's, everybody is, like I say, from dancers to, um, musicians they all say the same thing and but also another thing that uh, we spoke about also and this is the education part because I learned so much over the past year and the uh, over the pandemic when I even took pictures of the artists in their windows that just by speaking about the music and and explaining the music to me who uh, and, and I don't have any knowledge of or much knowledge of music um, it made me so inquisitive, you know, like somebody talking about Beethoven's music and a specific piece, then it would make me so inquisitive that I come home and, and listen. Um, what exactly. was he saying? Or can I hear it? And so on. And and I think uh, also I've, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful, like you say, you just speak to the audience, just give a little nudge, you know, just give that little, um, this is the story behind it, or just take note of this so and and that also makes you more sort of open to to listen to new works or the works that you haven't heard before Absolutely. yeah and also the idea that that you that you've never on a repeated listening of a piece uh, you always discover something new so yeah. so that there's not only one way of listening to a piece that there's always a, a, a delving deeper into a piece and and i think we're fortunate with that that we we can you know we have so much music available to us to listen to all the time and comparing recordings and and um and that you can that you can hear constantly hear new things i mean i think some composers some music as as deadly more depth to it so so mm -hmm. some you know some seem some pieces seem just endless about you know discovering new things uh, other pieces seems perhaps a little bit more uh, um not not shallow i don't but but yeah. but effective in another way i mean i think one must also remember that that music is there to set out to do something and and yeah. and if it does the thing it needs to do effectively then it's then it's perfectly okay um but yeah, I kind of, I also saw here in Cape Town in the music industry, people thinking about the, the speaking about music aspect. I, I know that Louise Howlett with the Cape Town concert series has now um, started, uh, some concerts are on Saturday mornings and, and then the audience can stay for 15 minutes after the concert where there's a short interview with the performers. Um, which which I I find that quite interesting because yeah. very often uh, you know I go say to a theatre performance or or ballet or something and and and, uh, and I have some questions which you you know would you always wish you can ask you know what about that issues and what why was that like that and and I I I find people respond quite quite well to that mm -hmm. yeah well I have this situation where two of my children are ballet dancers and. They they tell me what what to look for or what to 
uh, or they tell me the story before I go, and then I I know what, you know, I know a little bit more. But then on the other hand, I also have a, a specific taste. So sometimes they just say, oh, mom, don't bother coming. <laughs> you won't <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say that there is a, um, I won't say who it is, but there's a, there's a composer, <laughs> a 19th century composer, which I, um, I'm a bit like that. I, I just, I just, I can't seem to, to get a hold. And, and every five years, I, I, I think, okay, it's my five year mark. I'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'll keep on trying. <laughs> well, yeah, they know me so well because, uh, of course, I think it's it's also natural, isn't it? That you're not going to like everything, so so they know they'll tell the story and say, "But don't bother coming; you won't don't like it coming. anyway." <laughs> <laughs> and that's you know that's that's perfectly okay not everybody has to like everything and <laughs> and um, and and that's that's fine i mean yeah. i sometimes you know i i i think that's 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 an important thing to acknowledge because i you know i um sometimes i have people that come to me and say but they really they prefer 19th century music they, d they don't like rock music so okay. much. <laughs> but almost like a, a kind of confession yeah. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> but that's fine you don't have to <laughs> no need to apologize about <laughs> yeah no definitely but i think you must be a very chilled person because i mean baroque music is known to be very much relaxing and and you know Chill out music almost. Yeah, I, I kind of, I, um, I, I don't think I'm <laughs> the most chilled out person ever, but the music definitely helps. But, but I think uh, I kind of, I very often compare uh, rock music to jazz in the sense that you have a kind of walking bass line, a type of groove, you know, with chords on top of it, and then with the melodic stuff at the, on the top of that, you know, so you have this like, basis underneath that's a, that's a very grounded and and earthy thing and, and i like i like that idea it kind of pulls the music you know the music stands firmly with its feet on on the on on the earth um and then all kinds of magnificent magnificent things happen on top of that um but but yes i i'm very much attracted to that I, that idea the idea of music coming coming from the bottom in a way mm -hmm. and and moving upwards um uh, like like in jazz it's it's the same the, the, the music is constructed from the chords and the bass upwards it starts there whereas if we think about 19th century music often it's it, i feel it's the other way around it comes from the melodic aspect and and that then spills down into the bass um but also uh something i think a lot about is of course uh, the metronome was was really only invented in the 19th century um and very often baroque composers uh used to measure music the tempo of music or the feeling of music um to kind of bodily movements you know at a walking pace or oh, or uh, what what was known as tempo ordinario uh, which <laughs> i think was it quant one of the early writers on music mm. says something like uh, tempo ordinario is the the heartbeat of a healthy man just after lunch or something like okay. that <laughs> between 60 and 80 uh, beats per minute so i think the rock music is is in a way quite centered around uh, uh, your internal uh, okay. uh, pulse inside yeah. of you. And, oh, and, and some character and regular indications, uh, like presto, for instance, me doesn't mean fast, it means pressing. So in a way it means slightly faster than, than a comfortable uh, 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 a tempo that, that kind of coincides with your, with your... So I think Baroque music really there's a there's a kind of physical aspect to it which, which which is which is which is at the same time very earthy but also quite profound i think because it links it links with your your body in a way 
I think that's wonderful, isn't it? it I mean, it's it's very special then, if you think of it. Yeah. 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 Wow, I I learned so much um, all the time, and it, I find it so fascinating. Um, uh, but uh, Eric, tell me, uh, is do you have young um, people now also interested in the harpsichord and, and baroque music? I have a, yes, I have a few students which I'm quite happy happy about. Um, with the Cape Town Rock Orchestra, we have a young. Um, a uh, continued player. He plays harpsichord and chamber organ. Um, he's currently still a student at, at UCT, um, but we've kind of taken him a tailed event. We've taken him uh, on board and, and he plays for most of the projects um, because it's quite important to, I think, raise a new generation yeah. of, of interest. And I think getting back to that, I think uh, my friend Bill Robson, who builds the harpsichord, perhaps, you know, should have earlier on taken on an apprentice and transferred the skills. Um, but we also, we're very happy, with the Baroque Orchestra, we're quite lucky that we have a, a private donor that funds and um, our education projects. So, um, of course, now, post the lockdown, we could we'd finally uh, um, get on with it again because, because of regulations for the past two years, it was very, uh, uh, very reduced. Um, but we started the year with a, a whole day of workshops um, on the history of the symphony and the history of opera, where we then have uh, people with period instruments and Baroque singers demonstrating it in person, to, so to make it more real to the students. And, and in February we had, I think we had, we had over 200 students Wow. From across the West and Cape um, to to come and 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 we structure it in a way that that links with the school syllabus. So so to to in a way to to practically see what you're learning about. Because I I remember as a as a as a, a, a learner at school, you know, you read about this and that or something in a book about a recitative, and but unless you hear hear it yeah. it sounds like a really bizarre almost un understandable concept but if you hear it done in person you realize oh actually it's not that complex yeah. it's so we very much focus on demonstrating these concepts uh, practically um and again i i often uh, i often from the teacher's side the teachers who attend um would come up to you and say Actually, these things are quite difficult to explain or mysterious, but now that we see it in practice, it's 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 quite self-explanatory in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in I'm... a way, demystifying, demystifying uh, certain aspects of it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually spoke to a, a ballet dancer uh, in it was in her eighties and. I asked her what should change or where should change come so that young children are more um, aware of art and, and the art education. And she said it should start with the teachers. And it's, it's yeah, and it's interesting now that you say that you have teachers there that you can help to, to carry that over to the children. I, I think that's quite important. And I must say that that sometimes I think I have an easier job because I think teachers at school has to cover such a wide range of topics and fields that that they really need need to have superpowers to yeah. to really do that. I mean, uh, again, we spoke about it, and I tend to want to focus on on one thing, but but I, I think I would be a, a terrible a te a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they really they have, yeah. they really have to be experts on so many things, yeah. you know, and then and so 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 I I think then it's it's really it's 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 a good feeling, you know, feeling mm -hmm. that you are helpful, at least with a small a small part uh, of the syllabus. Yeah. Now Eric, tell me what is your wish for the future? Yeah, this is this is a difficult one. I I, I really um I feel especially since we've changed the name of the the previous Camerata Tent of Rocket to the Cape Town Baroque Orchestra, I want to work towards really, uh, you know, having focus on orchestral repertoire, um, but also having uh, 
kind of re-establishing the ensemble now post-COVID uh, that to a point where we, like we used to regularly get international um, uh, uh, okay. soloists with us and, and, and international guest leaders. Um, uh, so we were working very hard towards that. Also the, the, the annual Cape Town Brock Festival, it kind of um, started three years before, uh, three, we had three um, uh, festivals before COVID. So the thing really just kind of was starting to lift off mm -hmm. and they need, you know, COVID happen. So to establish that, you know, again and, and, and really turn it into an international international festival. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so that's 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 my um, my wish for the Baroque Orchestra to, to create um, because there are very few Baroque orchestra in the in the global south in the southern south, southern hemisphere. I mean, there's the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra, a friend of mine now um, uh, in Sydney. Um, uh, in, I, I see Perth has now got a, a Baroque orchestra um, founded by Helen Kruger, who used to play in the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Um, but but there are very few early ensembles uh, in the, in the glo global south. Um, um, and then on a personal level, my, my PhD is done now. I've, I've handed wow. it in and yeah. it's out of my life. Um, so I also want to now expand a little bit on that research because the research was about historical keyboard instruments, domestic keyboard instruments in South, Southern Africa and the role those instruments played in the colonization process. And um, so I very much focused on the kind of cultural meanings of keyboard instruments and, and what they represent within a culture and and then of course how that played out in 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 co colonial society but the in the process i discovered so many very very interesting things um and 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 so you kind of you i wrote the phd and kind of uh like um uh, I had to wash a little bit over those things to just get on with the bigger, yeah. bigger. But there are definitely th uh, uh, research fields I want to focus a little bit more on, um, and I'm, I'm preparing a, a, a panel discussion for the South African uh, Society for Research in Music later this year um, about keyboard in the history of keyboard instruments as diplomatic gifts. Um, oh. That is a very long history of organs being gifted from from England to to Constantinople, <laughs> uh, to the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. and from Constantinople to Franconia in the eighth century, and um, even uh, organs sent, were sent from as diplomatic gifts uh, in the sixteenth century from. Portugal to the Ethiopian Highlands. Um, a colleague of mine is doing research about that. Wow. So there's a whole a very intricate uh, crossing of, hmm. of keyboard instruments um, across the globe as diplomatic gifts. Um, and, and, and of course, there was a, 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 a little bit in my thesis about it, but I think that that will become quite an interesting uh, yeah. research in its own, yeah. Um, but I suppose that's a wonderful thing, you know, uh, in your research process, discovering things, you know, you, I remember sometimes sitting and reading something and thinking this, this is, this is astounding. I mean, I, yeah. you, you know, I never knew uh, that these things existed. Um, and of, of course, it also changes how you see your, your current engagement with, with, with these objects. Well, it's it's um, a new a new uh, thing that you can uh, get your teeth in and get focused on and <laughs> go in depth yeah. in like you like to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I I wonder, you know, the kind of research. I was lucky with the lockdown in a way because it was like a forced sabbatical. It forced me to oh, sit yeah. down and finish the. <laughs> um, but but it's it's. I had the conversation the other day with a colleague. It's it's difficult doing both in the same day. You know, you you writing and reading and writing. You kind of need separate time for that and playing and rehearsing. You you it's it kind of. I personally, I feel my my mind needs to go in a different space in order to do that so yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a it's a bit of a balancing act 
You know, I understand that. But, um, but you know, I spoke to an uh, organ builder there in South Africa, Archie De Vere. Do you know of him? Oh, yes. Victoria. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he told me of all the wonderful organs in the countryside in South Africa that he goes to repair and... Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. I mm-hmm. I met him in Namibia. Actually, I uh, I, I was doing a, a a lecture series and and a, a solo recital in Ventuk, and by coincidence, he was there that week, um, uh, 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 working on some organs and and the one I did the recital on, and he was he was incredibly helpful um, because the the organ in that church was positioned in quite a a, a strange place. There was a window behind, so in the morning and in the evening, the tuning was completely oh, different. I, I remember Archie sitting with me until late at night, retuning oh. <laughs> very patiently. Yeah. <laughs> now he's so. wonderful, and the work that he's doing is just amazing. How he's you know wants to get people playing the organ again, and uh, it's wonderful. Yeah. But now, um, Eric, I've got one more question for you. Do, can you do a shout out for a restaurant or a coffee shop in your area that you visit regularly? Um, uh, my, uh, my favorites, some of my favorite restaurants uh, uh, um, uh, closed during the lockdown, which oh, is, okay. which is, quite, <laughs> which is quite, quite, quite sad. Um, yeah. But I must say, my local restaurant is a Greek restaurant just down the road called Maria's, and it is the mo- on Dunkley Square, and it is the most fantastic food, and you always guarantee. Um, a good time and and the, the standard of food is really fantastic. Oh so. really? Okay, I'll I'll put the link of their website on the on please, the description. Please, yeah, yeah. Maria's on Dunkley Yeah. Well, this is so lovely to talk to you. Thank you and, very uh, much, Peter. I really appreciate it. Yes, and, and it, I, when I, I'm enjoying all the other interviews too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, when I'm yeah. back in South Africa, I will come and and uh, listen to your con- one of your concerts if uh, if there's a Please one. Please let me know when you. Yeah, there. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Eric. Okay, we're. Bye. 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 Bye.